So this whole session is managing a healthy chapter, and these are the four points that they're going to be addressing. So identifying potential nominees, engaging members, communication, which could be either among <coughs> the chapter or with the public, and then leadership. So we're going to start with Debbie. Okay, I'm from the Virginia Tech chapter. I'm Debbie Good, and um, I currently am the president. I've been the president for two years, and before that I was the treasurer for a long time. And yeah, I guess that's about it. <laughs> I've been in Sigma Xi since uh, I was a graduate student. Northwestern inducted me. I also was given an award as an undergraduate, which kind of started me thinking about Sigma Xi. So definitely um, the undergraduate thing is on my mind as well. Um, chartered in 1940, and we currently have, I think it's 121 actually when I looked, but we have a large number of inactive members as well as we've heard about in previous things. Um, so, yeah, we could probably, I always send things to them. Whether or not they get it, I don't know. I don't know who, who are we going next to. Is that still me? Oh, that is still me. Oh, did you organize it so that we all tell our thing in, conse in consecutive or because they were sort of separated? Well, it, it, you had different slides. We're doing all of the nominees. Got it. Okay, so. sorry. Okay. Okay. So I had looked at it, but of course, when you build a slide deck from four people, it sometimes is a little bit uh, confusing. So anyway, um, identifying new uh, potential nominees. Um, our major way of doing that is uh, we are we are fortunate enough that the um, Virginia Tech Foundation has a nice endowment that they have no one to distribute for. So they approached us a couple of years ago and said, would you distribute this endowment money for us? And it has to be in some sort of um, environmental research, which we now interpret as environmental research as anything, right? The cell environment, the animal environment, the water environment. <laughs> the, and so, and they, and they, I mean, they were fine with that. So we get to distribute um, $6,000 in awards every year from this endowment. Um, and then for those students that win awards, and we give awards to undergraduates, master's students, and PhD students, um, we pay for their um, induction into Sigma Xi. And a lot of times we actually have runner up, runners up as well that really did a great job, and so we induct them as well. So um, they don't get the $1,000, so that's what the prize is. We give six winners $1,000, um, but we give the runners up um, induction as well that keeps us inducting members every year um, and also these are all student members and um, I should say and this is kind of a, a leadership thing I guess is um, one of our students no two of our students who have won awards in the past are now officers in our um, in our chapter so they have continued with us and they're really involved super involved so I think that actually can happen cost is low poster printing for the session I offer but most students just use a poster they already had um, and we say that's perfectly fine you don't have to like tweak a poster you can just bring one you already have but if you want us to print it we'll print it for you um, and uh, we just provide some light refreshments and actually always we have it a, a little bit off campus where I work um, so that we can have champagne I think the champagne is a nice touch because you pop it you toast the new inductees and then um, go on except for the undergraduates <laughs> so um, and then the other thing that we did um, this year was actually to start inducting Sigma Xi Explorers. Um, we, and actually my daughter's chemistry teacher from the high school contacted me and said, I see I'm getting these emails from you and I'd like to talk to you more about my high school students. And so then it started this um, whole thing where we decided that we were going to induct these high school students as um, Sigma Xi explorers. Um, 
some of their parents came to this induction and, some, and being that Virginia Tech is in Blacksburg and these are Blacksburg high school students, some of their parents were former Sigma Xi members. I tried to get them back in. I think it's gonna work eventually, but, um, but they didn't right then. Uh, and we're actually, now that the motion is passed for the Explorers Club, we're really strongly considering uh, pulling that together with the help of this high school science teacher who, who we also inducted. She was not currently a member of Sigma Xi and we inducted her as a member, um, as a regular member. So, um, yeah, hopefully. I mean, those students were amazing. Yeah, they, 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 and she mentors them to go to all of these competitions. So some of them had presented multiple poster sessions and won multiple prizes for their high school work. One of them had a paper. We considered that he could be full, um, but then decided we just wanted to induct the whole group as high school explorers at this point, um, just so that, because they all really probably could have had a paper and and I I yeah we felt like it should just be the one but that the one category all of those could be associate members not students that's associate is yeah. presenting oh that is meeting. true that they is true they could be inducted as associate members as a, not yeah. as a club member that um, is because true because they have presented data from unique research at a you event. know you're absolutely right and so don't I, we don't probably should have done that schoolers as associate members there's sometimes overlook like that very good point we probably sure. need to do that and i think now i'm done but i don't know it, it oh, is going to you the ohio part. state <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Weisler. I'm a professor of physiology and cell biology and director of graduate studies at The Ohio State University. I also direct the postdoctoral office there. And I'm also a uh, two-year president of the Sigma Xi chapter at Ohio State. Now on to three years, our, uh, I was supposed to move on, but our uh, new vice president decided he was going to leave The Ohio State University. So one has to be dynamic when it comes to leadership. All right, so uh, the Ohio State chapter uh, was chartered in 1898. It was one of the first uh, eight uh, or, or chapters in the organization. We just celebrated our 120th anniversary, uh, made a big deal about that, so that was an exciting aspect of being president during that year. We're currently, uh, it, it varies throughout the year, but around 200 members, usually between 200 and 300 members, and we ducked about 40 members per year. Um, principally from the faculty, but also from undergraduate and graduate students as well. Um, nice picture of the campus there, the Oval. Oh, that's fancy. Uh, so uh, I guess we started off talking about potential, identifying potential nominees. Uh, one of our key aspects of that is uh, we, at Ohio State, we have a vast variety of different types of uh, poster sessions where undergraduate and graduate students can present their research. Uh, so most of our members, and particularly those on our executive board, tend to be people who are um, who are the sort of people who judge these sort of events. Uh, so we uh, consider this to be one of the really important ways that we recruit people into the chapter. One of the uh, uh, we actually make up a little little card. It's a little bigger than a business card, but not quite much bigger than that. And we give them to our members who are going to be judging these events, and they go around and they pass them out to people they think who would be uh, interesting candidates to apply for membership. And we put the little uh, QR code on there. That's that's what the kids are using these days, as I understand it. And that takes them right to the uh, right to the application form on our website. So it's a it's an easy way for them to get access to the ability to apply to the organization. Uh, we've actually had some pretty good success with that uh, with that approach. It's a really personal approach. You know, if somebody who's a judge comes up and looks at you as you're judging the poster, and then tells you you did a great job, and here here's you should be part of Sigma Xi the Research Honor Society and give them that card, uh, we, we get really good outcomes for that. So that's, uh, that's a tip that I would suggest to people. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then, uh, so I mean, we'll talk about this, everyone's got an annual banquet, right? Uh, but our research symposium that we do for that, so that's a poster session we do as well, we invite the winners from each of these on-campus forums to present at that poster session. So we get people who are, and it's a wide variety because it's a lot of different <coughs> colleges on the campus, 
but we get the best posters from all of these different events. So we have a really, we have the all-star session on campus. So we actually get the vice president of research to come by. We get a lot of people in the uh, upper echelons of the research administration to come to this event. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, students are really excited to have that take place. So it's a really great event and it really encourages them to apply. And we do that before our annual banquet when we have our annual speaker and such. So that's actually another chance to cement that uh, opportunity for them to apply for uh, apply for membership in Sigma Xi. Oh, and the, uh, another aspect of what we do that is, I'm sure others will talk about, is grants and aid of research. Uh, we already talked a little bit about that. But we actually, this is a good way that we recruit uh, faculty members as well. So we go out and when we, uh, when, when a faculty member wins one of these awards, so usually we give out about six awards every year. And we don't have an endowment, so we actually, most of the funding that comes from this comes from sponsors. So an advantage of being on a, a big campus is a lot of money gets spent, so a lot of uh, suppliers are willing to chip in 500 or $1,000 to help sponsor an award for undergraduates or graduate students, uh, and actually postdocs as well. And they actually enjoy that because it gets their name out in front of these, uh, in front of these uh, different types of uh, students. And they're the ones who make the purchasing decisions, so we in emphasize to that, and they like to contribute to these sort of awards as well. So that's, a, that's been a real effective way of us raising money to be able to, to support these awards. And we do this in a variety of different types of research fields, as I'm sure you do as well. Uh, we keep it at $1,000 for the graduate students and 500 for the undergraduate students as well. But as I mentioned, we use this as a recruiting tool not just for those students, but also for the faculty as well, because if we have a faculty member who comes on and one of their students wins this award, we encourage them not just to join as members if they aren't members already, but also recruit them to be on our executive board as well. Because we assume somebody who's um, pursuing the opportunity to get their students these sort of awards is somebody who's interested in pursuing that in other ways as well. So that's a, a good way that we recruit people onto our executive board as well. Yep. All right. There you go. I got one. I got no, one there. All right. Here. <laughs> Even better. We'll run out of slack anyway. Yep, exactly. I don't think I have the one slide. Hi, um, Tina from the DC chapter. I'm the MI board uh, director for this next three years. Um, the DC is an area chapter, so we encompass NIH, USDA, and private and commercial enterprises around the DC Metro Beltway. Um, we were originally chartered in 1915 at the Smithsonian. Um, so it's actually a Smithsonian chapter. Um, if you ever get down to the North Carolina headquarters, our original charter is actually an embossed piece of glass. It's the negative print from when they photo they made a photograph. So it's a glass a glass plate um, with all the signatures on it. We currently have only 270 active members. When um, I was elected in 1999 in the same sentence that I was made vice president of the chapter. So I was been president since 2000. I'm finally handing over the reins um, to another member who has graciously offered to take over with some fresh ideas. Um, we have a very bad problem identifying potential members because most of our institutions, we don't have students. We just have people who come in from and they work at institutions. And identifying members is very hard for us, which is why that amendment is kind of for MI chapters like mine, which don't have a student base to elect members from. We have we used to have a lot of activities um, that we identified potential members at cafes. If you want to become a member of Sigma Xi, we did out of box events. We did a bunch of different things to attract new members. Um, most of the members come through self nominations for DC chapter. And they may affiliate, but then they become at large or something like that. Um, so we make our put our name out there for a lot of uh, different events, um, and have partnered with other chapters. But um, yeah, for us, it's really hard in identifying them because unfortunately, people come into the area being U Michigan or UF or U10 or VT, and they go, "We're I'm, we're here in the DC metro area," and they're like, "Oh no, we're we're members of the Michigan chapter." <laughs> So I make sure that they get all of our, our emails through a zip code poll of membership within the DC metro area. Um, so we do get some that reactivate because I make sure to include all of my inactives about two, three years backwards 
inactives, I include on all the emails of all our events. So re reactivating inactive members can also count towards that, that quote that you need to make of new members because they're reactivating. I don't think, I think that's the only slide I have. Oh, team. Nope. I was going to say, so so when I, w I was at the NIH, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think I stayed at the Northwestern chapter yeah. then. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, but, you know, I had a fantastic, um, they have a lot of programs for high school students to work at NIH, and I'm wondering if you can recruit, you know, just like you said to me, well, they if they presented, whatever. I had a high school student, phenomenal. He's now a professor uh, down at Emory. And uh, that ages me, doesn't it? If I had a yeah. high school student. Okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> but you know, I, I just just wanted to mention that because that yeah. could be a source for you guys, um, the high school students. Yeah, I had my vice president was actually at NIH, and he sent he's since way long retired, so it was hard to make connections mm. of doing that. My emails always say, you know, come out and. If you know anybody, bring somebody, bring a friend, whatever. But and I get your emails still. Yeah. Why and this, is that? Well, this past year, it's because you're in the Mid Atlantic group. Mid Atlantic okay. group. Okay. I was like, I think and I'm still on your. When we list. did a zip code poll, too many outlier zip codes were pulled in, so we kind of opted everybody in, and then we've been deleting us. You've been opted in. I've you been can, opted in. Opted it's okay. In. I, I love seeing what they do. Yes, they do a lot opted of in. Really we used good to do cafes. a lot this past year. Our cooperation with the local science. Um, Museum, well, it's a science center in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, there just became a conflict of interest with the cafe process that we were, we did 12 years of cafes once a month. And that relationship fell apart this past year. So I've been looking into other options with that, but haven't gotten too far with it at this point. But yeah, so we highlight things. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm from Marquette University. Can you speak up, please? Or go yeah, microphone. use the microphone. Yeah. Okay, so I'm actually from Marquette University, Wisconsin. We have a lot of high school students who come in to take college level credit. Mm -hmm. And some of them do end up publishing. So I have two questions. So is the bar for like publishing, they don't publish in like high quality. They just get published in some journals or they go to some high school level conferences. So isn't the bar a little bit higher for like... Nope. No. So, nope. Any sorts of publication is mm -hmm. okay. At the associate level, so go onto our website. If you go sigmazai.org and you go membership, there's a link on that page that says the addendum for clarification on membership. Membership in Sigma Xi is not based on a master's, a PhD, or anything. Just because you have a degree doesn't mean you're a member of Sigma Xi automatically. It depends on the publication and peer reviewed journals. For full membership is two authored papers. Each chapter has their own ability to override that. Like, I'm a full member, but I only have a master's. I have no first author papers because of my job with the federal government, I wasn't allowed to publish. I was a, a, a name on a list of authors because I wrote the protocol, did the protocol, edited the protocol, but I wasn't allowed to be an author on the paper. Um, so my chapter said, hey, you deserve full membership and you can't publish, it's not your fault. Um, so each chapter has that ability to override what it is. At the associate level, it's an interest in science, which is, can be shown with a presentation at a juried poster session, scientific proceedings, a journal that's not, the only problem we have at CQM right now is that we have a lot of these self-published science journals that are online. And I've actually had talks with editors of those and some of their processes, the, the peer review is like, oh, well, we told the person to give the paper to their friends to edit. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's not really peer review. <laughs> so there's some journals that I will automatically discount if I see them because I know their editorial process is just, it's basically self-publication. Um, so I do vet when I see an application come through, whether the proceedings are real or a self, a blog. That blog doesn't count as one. Um, but at associate member, a high school student who presents a poster of original research that they worked in a lab over the summer or work college level credits is associate member. Uh, and my second question was like, uh, inducting them into our chapter. So if eventually most of these students, no one actually eventually ends up going to market. They eventually go, end up going like to other places. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, 
So do we uh, induct them into our chapter mm -hmm. and then they actually end up leaving and not actually working actively for the chapter? So. You induct them in your chapter. Um, a lot of our members mistakenly think that when you move, your membership moves with you, but it does not. Your membership stays with the chapter you became a member at unless you change it. So if you know that your student at Marquette is now going to, oh, let's see, University of Maryland. Maryland has a chapter. You can pro be proactive at it at, at your end and say, contact the University of Maryland chapter and say, hey, my student's coming to you get in touch with them and get them involved. They have to change their membership to Maryland. You cannot do that, nor can the chapter do that. They have to do that. And I think that realization isn't known a lot, um, so we need to communicate that more. But induct them as your chapter, and then it, when they move, they move. If they stay a member of your chapter despite all that, that's what they do. That's their choice. So. With yep. the communities, and you can affiliate with a bunch of communities on our website. So you can affiliate with the DC chapter being a member of Marquette. So that's up to them and up to you on both ends. And I just add to that. So um, I know uh, that some people might say, well, why would I want to tell the other chapter that they've got somebody coming? Um, but if you're looking at the big picture of Sigma Xi as national organization um, and not just, you know, the chapter itself, you've inducted so you've gotten that good standing thing you needed. Um, but probably retention of students is, is going to be better if they're associated with active chapters. So if they are going to University of Maryland and are no longer associated with Marquette, and now they no longer get the Marquette emails, um, or they get them, but they think, I can't go to any of that, they probably disassociate from Sigma Xi. So it's probably a really good idea to help your students transfer. Something I've really thought about a lot at this meeting is how do we make sure that our students understand that they can transfer and then get involved with that other chapter? Because that's where they're gonna be retained. And the other retention is that they only have a Marquette.edu address listed with the chap with your chapter. They're never that address goes defunct when they graduate or whatever. So it's good to have a secondary, have their Gmail or Yahoo or whatever account as the secondary that we can then, if things start bouncing, move that email forward and have a have a good contact for them. And typically, we try to reach out. If, if the EDU address is the only one we have, we do try to reach out and say, hey, we'd like a secondary address because we don't, we don't want to lose that. Yeah, we don't want to lose the connectivity to them. Yeah, we yeah. tend to collect a, a secondary address whenever we have the opportunity as well. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, we just offer to identify potential members. Any activity you have, bring a friend. <laughs> Let us know. We'll make the contact. And a lot of people don't want, they don't want to make the offer, but if you give us, an, like, people will give me a name, say, I really don't want to contact them. I'll, I'll reach out with a nice, friendly email or a phone call or whatever to identify new members. Yes? I never really thought about it before, but, you know, so many of the chapters are associated with universities, but just say, for example, that some of the chapters are associated with universities, but just say, for example, that somebody that, you know, that was a you know, an undergraduate or graduate student, one of your institutions, for some bizarre reason, got a job in Lubbock, Texas, and you know they, they have nothing whatsoever to do with Texas Tech University. But could they join the Texas Tech? University? Anybody can. Yeah. Each chapter has the autonomy to induct any member from anywhere that joins that that wants to join their chapter. Historically, some chapters have been very close, so that if they're at a university, they only allow. But these days, they're opening, more and more chapters are coming to these meetings and realize they don't have to just identify members within their own university. They can identify members outside their community. And yeah, it does make your chapter less of a you know, university chapter, but at the same point, you're gaining members and you're reaching scientists who have some input into your chapter, so. But yeah, more, more chapters are learning that they don't have to be contained to a university. We have more and more area chapters actually that smaller chapters are saying, hey, we're within 25 miles of each other. Let's just make one chapter and expand our you know, actually, circle of influence. Last year I inducted someone from Texas and we are at 
in Illinois, a full member from Texas, just because I knew her as a physics colleague. Yeah, it is and it isn't. I mean, yeah, I'd say it is. It gives them the opportunity and mm -hmm. it opens that venue for them to accept it the and have a mentor. Yeah, I mean, that's associate membership, it's too. Associate I mean, it's membership. not exactly the same thing as a full membership either. But I mean, part of the, I mean, in my opinion, one of the important aspects is not just the outreach, but the encouragement aspects of what Sigma Xi does. You know, I mean, being able to, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here as well, but I mean, that's to me one of the great aspects of the organization is the encouragement of early career scientists, even back in high school, about encouraging them to become yeah. professional scientists. So, I mean, adding that aspect of it, I think it is a vital part of what the society does. I think your chapter can have that conversation and make those, you know, decide what they want to do. But our chapters had those conversations and to some extent we're like, you know, if this undergrad ends up becoming a politician, but yep. they've had a positive experience mm -hmm. in science, oh my God, thank goodness, thank goodness. Yeah. That's probably a good thing. Or if they become yep. a music teacher, but they still have had a positive experience in science and support science, yeah. that the more citizens broadly that we could have, me as a scientist, that's probably good for me yep. in my career, the more citizens that are out there that have had positive interactions, thought like a scientist, even if that's not where their final trajectory takes them. Right. The great travesty of public education in the United States is lack of encouragement of passion in science. Can I just make a comment? Uh, I would like for all uh, panelists to present first, and then we open, it, we'll open the okay. floor up for questions. This way we have all the four... Oh, no, this is going great. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, so. <laughs> Oh, that's not even the start. We got more perspectives after that. So. I know we can get so deep into the conversation. Um, so. We got all night. I don't know where you're going. <laughs> well, I thought you had a probably mine is the most. <laughs> it's open late. <laughs> mine's the most different from what you've heard so far. Uh, it's a fairly new chapter, 1995, right? And. Uh, it's a primarily undergraduate liberal arts institution, just one hour and 15 minutes south of here. Uh, we are not even a very selective institution. So, you know, looking at it, 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 it seems like it might be difficult to uh, sustain such a set chapter. As you can see from the charter over there, it was formed with just four members in it. Uh, you can't make out the signatures, but it was formed with four members. Well, uh, up until last year, we were not in good standing. We were barely managing to keep it active, right? So with certain activities here and there, in all those years of existence, there was only maybe one GIAR award that one of the students received. So uh, probably, uh, well, I didn't introduce myself first. I'm Deep Shika Shukla, by the way. I teach physics, and I'm at Rockford University. Uh, the turnaround came last year. Last year was the first year I went to a Sigma Xi annual meeting, right? Uh, that was probably the first year any of us ever went to a meeting. So I learned the ins and outs. I met with Iman, I met with Jasmine, I met with everybody to figure out a way. And last year we inducted eight or nine members three of which full members, rest are all student members. Now, uh, associate members. We do uh, insist that our students carry out some kind of a research, and because we are a small institution, it's, it helps us to make this personal relationship with students so we can pursue them uh, individually. We do expect our students to present at the regional conference 
uh, whatever research they did. So it is based on some amount of scholarship, some, of, some amount of rigorous scholarship, I, su I should say. Um, we do give them some support um, in the sense that although we do not have a lot of money, but we do have access to a fund which is called the Student Opportunity Fund. It's a competitive fund, so students can ask for money or apply for money to go to present at a conference and so on and so forth. Uh, we do give uh, the new inductees, student inductees, we do uh, help them with their first year's membership fees. But earlier in the day, I think I heard a comment about, you know, then students don't have a skin in the game, sort of, you know, because you're paying their first year's in uh, membership fee. But in a sense, we do because we, they still pay for their initiation fees. They pay for uh, certain uh, privileges that they get, get at the local level. So it, it works out to be an equal amount of investment from their side as it is from our side for the first year. We, we are now trying to get them earlier on in the sense that we were looking last year at seniors who were about to graduate, but then the turnover is also more because of obvious reasons, because they don't stay, right? And it's difficult to get touch with them if they're away. Uh, so we're trying to get them earlier. So last semester we inducted one person who was a junior. Now we are trying to get them even earlier because at the sophomore level, at least in the biology department, at the chemistry department, and in the math department, they start intro to research in their sophomore year. So hopefully we'll be able to get students as early as sophomores so that we can have a few years with them and they take ownership of the chapter, basically. I think that is it. Yeah, back to you, Debbie. Okay, so, um, oh, let me see. So now we're trying to talk about engaging members with other things that our chapter does. Um, one of the things that we did from the very beginning when John Nemeth um, first started March for Science with all the rest of the groups who then came in with Sigma Xi um, is we've had our annual um, March for Science local um, and we team up with a local activist group who, who marches for lots of things in Blacksburg and they'll march for that too. <laughs> so it works out really well for us. Um, the one year, we did not do it last year, and I was trying to think back, and someone reminded me it was the Virginia Tech spring football game, and Virginia Tech did not allow us to get a spot on campus to do it that day, and we like to do it on the day of March for Science. So, yeah, that you know, we football, science, football, science, you football. Have, you got to have priorities. <laughs> priorities there, yeah. Um, so that definitely is something that um, we, we have a, a decent turnout for. It's super fun, um, and there's really not a lot of cost associated with that, you know, literally I printed out the posters on the March for Science site and got some glue sticks and stuck them to boards. <laughs> that was the end of that. Um, so that's March for Science. We're planning to do it again in 2020. Um, we also this year, I think a great program that Sigma Xi National runs is the Distinguished Lecture Series and the grants for those. Um, it wasn't cheap to bring James Costa to Virginia Tech, actually. We had him there for three days. To, he spoke two different days. He did a Science on Tap, which is our community outreach, and he did a regular lecture. Um, we had hands-on demonstrations, um, and it, it probably was about $1,000 of our money as well as $1,000 that we got from Sigma's eye to be able to do that, but plan we, we definitely plan to do that again. It was an amazing event, and we did see more. I think we saw a lot more of our members coming out, and the community really liked it too. Um, do I have more? Oh. Yeah. Okay. What is that? Oh, I was going to say suds and science. We don't do that. Uh, we, <laughs> uh, we love that. Uh, so actually, so this is. Um, 
this is an event that we actually started fairly recently. I guess it was two years ago. I don't know if that's something to do with me being president, but uh, the the idea was that uh, uh, actually kind of uh, when. I joined the organization there when I moved to Ohio State. I went through some of the old we, – we, one of the cool things we have is we have all the minutes going back like you know 120 years, like all in a big pile, right? So went through it, and I, I noticed that a lot of the time there was references to meeting at different bars, which I thought was interesting and not all that surprising if you've ever been to Ohio State. But – uh, they sort of inspired this idea, and this was actually, uh, it was me and Mark Peoples, who's actually down here, who hosted the first one, Mark Peoples, former uh, president of the national organization. And the idea here was that we had great, I mean, like many of you, we have great uh, different types of centers of research excellence on campus, right? And But you don't really get to see those all the time. So we thought, well, why don't we have different members uh, have an opportunity to kind of show off their research program and some of the cool things they have in their research groups, and then have an opportunity to be able to uh, show off that uh, to different members and also other members of the community. And then afterwards, we could uh, kind of maintain the tradition at Ohio State and go off for the, uh, after the science, we could go off the suds and then move to a local uh, watering hole for further discussions, as they say. So that that's kind of was the idea behind this. And uh, actually, we've had really good uh, turnout on this. We've had many different members of the organization who are interested in showing off some of the things that they do on an everyday basis in their laboratory. Um, for example, we have a great anthropology department that'd like to show us some of the, uh, the work they do with uh, ancient human skeletons. Um, Mark Peebles talked about his uh, vaccine production work. And we recently, our most recent one was in the Bird Polar Research Center, which is a really um, world-class center for the study of, uh, of climatology, uh, where they have uh, the largest selection of ice core samples on the planet, all stored in this massive football field-sized freezer. We call it a football-sized freezer because that's how we measure everything at Ohio State. So the, the idea there, and you actually got to hold these ice core samples that were you know, like going back tens of thousands of years, uh, so it was a really interesting event there too, although it was kind of cold. Uh, but uh, this, th we've actually had a lot of success with this as a chance to both show off the research excellence uh, in different uh, members' laboratories, but also it gives an opportunity to reach out to the members and give them a chance to really get some value for their membership as well and give them a chance to see something they wouldn't normally see. Uh, we also, uh, uh, one of the events we host on campus is Ohio State Science Day. So this is our statewide, uh, for the state of Ohio, uh, science fair. So there's, uh, actually, you can see them all here. There's thousands of kids there, uh, high school, actually junior high through high school students who are presenting their research projects. So they've won at their state, le at their school level, at their regional level, and now we're at the state science fair here. And we uh, judge a couple of, we sponsor two different special awards there, the Disciplinary Research Award and the uh, Science Evolution Award. And uh, we, our members have an opportunity to help uh, uh, judge these events. Uh, so it's a special event where we go around and, or the special awards, so we go out and judge particular uh, projects that, uh, that volunteer to be judged for that particular award. So it gives us the benefit of also engaging our members, but also recruiting, uh, like what we were talking about earlier, uh, explorers uh, into Sigma Xi, but also recruiting them to come to Ohio State as well and, and join us uh, as they develop as scientists and scholars. So that's a great event and also uh, really also provides value to our members as well because it's a great opportunity for them to do science outreach activities. Yep. Yep. Oh, no, you are. That's yeah. right. I, Stop. <laughs> I forgot we were in a fancy place like Wisconsin. They got multiple microphones. I know. It's... Um, At Ohio State, we only have one microphone. But you do win at football against uh, we, Madison. <laughs> Sorry about all that. It is. The it, this is. That's exactly right. It's the, the microphone. That's why there's one. I'll note that Ohio University won today, but they didn't show up to pick it up. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh. <laughs> anyway, engaging members. Um, when I first became vice president and president of the D.C. chapter, um, the format at that point in time was lecture and a dinner, lecture and a dinner, lecture and a dinner, and you send everything by postage and by mail, and you print it, and you sealed, and you address stamped, and my former ex-husband and I spent nights on the couch sealing envelopes and stamping them and, and getting them ready to mail. 
And we had, I had many members who loved that format. They loved dinner and a lecture. And I try to rotate them around the DC Beltway because I'm an area chapter that encompasses miles. Um, and that worked for some. And as our membership, as I realized how to engage our members better, we started doing the cafe series 12 years ago, and that was that's a great venue. Um, we found a really good place to hold it. We rotated a couple times, um, and we found members that really liked that. And then I started thinking about outside, what I call outside of the box, and that has developed into explorations. Um, but we do botanical walks and geology walks. And I found geologists in my group and, hey, could you do this? Could you do it here? I found botanists, hey, DC encompasses the National Arboretum. One of my people in my lab is now the manager of the National Arboretum. I'm like, hey, would you give a walk on genetics of breeding crepe myrtles? And so we had a botanical walk through the National Arboretum. Um, don't don't be confined by the box. Scientists were supposed to think outside of the box, and that's what I started doing with my chapter. Um, we've gotten lots of you know contact your local museums or nature centers, and what I say is like people. The the reason why I my my take on cafes, science cafes or suds in science, is because like this is a very bad venue to teach people. They're sitting in a seat like school. Your mind goes like this. <laughs> and you put a beer in front of a person on a table and you teach them something and all of a sudden the brain cells open up and they actually absorb something. <laughs> <laughs> Alcohol dependent gene expression. That's right. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing when you take some of these people. Redox who, management genes. They turned on. It really is. Yeah. But you take them out of a classroom type situation and they absorb the science that much better. Um, so don't, that's how I engage members, all sorts of events. Yeah, it takes a lot of work to do that. And unfortunately, this past year, my life has gone beyond having time to organize these for my chapter. Um, but this is what the opportunities you can have for your members, the more engaging you can be across your membership. So yeah, don't leave those who like that dinner and a lecture out of the game. Have, have one of those a year, but then have identify the other needs of your members and how to attract them. Um, like I say, science doesn't have to happen in a classroom. It can happen anywhere. So that's how I keep my members engaged. On to you. Oh, that's me. Here. Uh, we, even though we were not in good standing, we did manage to put out some programming <laughs> because we were an active chapter. Uh, we... Every year, uh, at least since I've been at Rockford University, we've written the Distinguished Lecture Subsidy Award, and we've gotten money to invite someone uh, as a distinguished lecturer, and we put that on uh, every year, so we plan to keep that going. What helps us is collaborating with other organizations on campus. Even though we, per se, might not have much money, but our local ACS chapter has a lot of money. And uh, at Rockford University, we also have what we call as a forum series, which all students are required to attend two of those events every semester. So it's a collaboration between us, the ACS chapter, and the forum series to engage the public as well as our own students. So that actually goes very well. Uh, one thing that I haven't written here in the pipeline is something that we are trying to grow organically in the sense that we want to encourage our students to give back to the community in the sense uh, we're trying to develop what we, with what we're calling as a college knowledge program uh, to engage elementary and middle school kids in not so privileged areas. So the students are responsible for developing the programming for that college knowledge program, be a mentor for those kids so that they can aspire one day to come to college. So uh, apart from that, uh, we also 
have been talking to a couple of local high schools to start an Explorers Club to take advantage of the new change in uh, policies. So hopefully that will take off and maybe we, this is one of the areas that we keep growing in. Pass the potato. I'm going to say that. Pass the potato. I'm assuming I'm next. Uh, yes. Okay, so um, we don't have suds in science, but we do have science on tap Close at enough. the NRV. Um, <laughs> and I am not going to take credit for this really at all. Katie Burke, who's the digital editor for American Scientist, um, lives in Floyd. Huh? Digital features. digital features editor for American Scientist. Um, lives in Floyd and approached us as well as the Center for Communicating Science to see if we could get something together. And our Science on Tap is very much um, interactive. There are no PowerPoint slides allowed. Um, it's, uh, you've got, you usually have a demo, you have a trivia game. Um, the speaker is not paid. They get a, they get a beaker flask with beer in it. Um, it's held at the brewery, so we don't have to actually go to the brewery. It's held at the brewery, so you can drink as you're there. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and you can see lots of different events we've done. We, we have, of course, our Floyd, our Michigan water person. I did some uh, DNA testing. We made DNA from spit. There's fossils. There's all sorts of things. Um, and uh, cost is really just minimal, the advertising and the, the beaker glass full of beer. Um, and we actually do collect d donations. It's currently going through like the Center for Communicating Science, but we have to figure out how to have that actually come through us so that they can have a nonprofit status anyway. That's one of the issues, but definitely the donations are what um, gives that. And it's mainly a few members and then community members. They bring their dogs, they bring their kids. I love seeing the kids there because the kids get a huge kick out of what's going on in the science and all you can think is that you're maybe touching their minds. Um, do I have another one? Nope, nope. That's, that's you. Thank you. Communication, well, I, I think there's probably, I mean, a lot of chapters do science cafes. Um, sometimes that's off campus, sometimes that's on campus. We actually do ours on campus. Uh, we do this in partnership with the uh, Ohio State University Library System. And that's one thing I toss out is there as well. I mean, you know, there's ample opportunities on most campuses to be able to partner and do uh, groups and do uh, different types of activities along with that. It distributes the, the cost, distributes the labor, and it still gives you a chance to do that outreach component and also recruit members without necessarily having to uh, put as much of your money or your time involved in that. So that's one of the parts that um, we'll, we really see effective on our Science Cafe. And like most, it's a monthly seminar series kind of thing that's open to the public. Um, we, we kind of base ours based off, we usually use faculty members as speakers. Many of them are our members. If not, we try to get them to become members. Uh, but one of the thing, one of the key parts about this is we really try to find things that are gonna draw people in and get a good audience. You can see a couple of things here. This is two examples of that. Uh, some of our more recent, um, really, really highly attended ones is when you can nail something like the eclipse in 2017. I mean, that was one of our best attended ones when you can kind of get something that's in the news and get people to show up. Um, so that was when we actually had a graduate student present that actually, whose uh, research was based on looking at uh, changes in the, um, the orbit of the moon as well. Um, also another one that we've had uh, looking at the opioid crisis. So one of our uh, members of our faculty in the School of Pharmacy talking about their research associated with that. And we actually also do uh, opportunities for them to learn about uh, those that aren't our members or haven't had a lot of experience in doing science outreach activities. We actually give them a chance to uh, attend activity we do at our, um, with our university's Institute for Teaching and Learning where it's converting science into easily understandable things for the general populace. So uh, that's a short uh, uh, workshop that they go through as well before they do this, uh, do this session. Uh, so that's one of the things we use as a communication vehicle. Another one, and this is uh, one that we really like, uh, uh, Meet a Scientist. This is our uh, sort of our flagship science outreach program. In this, we uh, look at, uh, we actually done a couple of iterations of this over the last few years, trying to kind of refine how we want to do this. But a lot of this is, uh, we, we 
basically I've broken it down into two main ways. The first is we uh, go out and reach out to classrooms and civic organizations, and that's both with uh, graduate students and faculty. So um, we actually had partnered with uh, a few specific local junior highs to do after school activities. And we also solicit uh, for uh, different types of uh, civic organizations to have us provide speakers to them as well. And these are members as well as volunteers from the faculty. And this actually won the uh, 2018 Chapter of Program Excellence Award from Sigma Xi. And this year we've actually expanded this program as well to add a, a newer component as well. Uh, that actually is the, and we've talked to, heard about this at the meeting already, trying to reach out to, uh, to uh, sponsor science fair project mentoring for students. Um, I mentioned earlier the state science fair, that's a big part of what we do every year. But uh, they, they, like many organizations, see less and less people wanting to do science fair uh, uh, they've gone from like multiple thousands down to uh, down to just over a, a thousand now at their uh, at their annual event, and we we're trying to reverse that by helping to sponsor uh, and and actually um, mentor students in local high schools as they prepare prepare their uh, projects for the state science fair. Uh, so that's something we're uh, hoping will grow into something even larger and more faculty outside of the ones that we have within Sigma Xi too. But that's one of the other, another way we do science outreach activities. And we also start talking about partnering not just on campus but also off campus. Uh, we partner with our local uh, science uh, museum which is called COSI. And when we do that, uh, this is an event actually not for, uh, not for students uh, but actually for adults. Uh, they call it COSI After Dark. It's a great event. Uh, they have beer in there and, uh, and food comes in and uh, they open up all of the museum to adults only uh, and it's in the evening. And then uh, this is a monthly event and they do public science lectures. So uh, we have our members, are the, we are the ones who provide the speakers for these events. So our members as well as again faculty volunteers from campus do these science outreach events. And of course if they aren't members we encourage them to become members. Uh, let's see. Central Ohio Science and Industry. It does. <laughs> Thank you. I was cl I was just about to say that. <laughs> um, it's been around for quite a while, uh, but uh, the uh, so this is both an opportunity to do COSI after dark, and we also provide opportunity. That's, that's faculty principally who do who does the COSI after dark lectures, but we also have a great opportunity uh, for our students to be able to present at the COSI Academy as well. So that's a that's an outreach activity that they run, but we provide students who actually do the activities. And this is actually Kelly Crow, who is one of my students. And uh, actually, she, uh, through working in that, she was able to secure a faculty job immediately after finishing graduate school, uh, which, as you know, in biomedical science is a rarity these days. So it, it's a really great opportunity for those students as well. So I just like, uh, I think that's a great opportunity uh, for to think about partnering with local institutions and how you can provide experts from your faculty and from your graduate students to be able to help them uh, fulfill their outreach missions as well. I think that's it for me. Yep. Yep. Okay, getting, um, yeah, communication, getting your messages out. Like I said, the communities on the sigmazi.org page are yours to manage as chapter leaders. Um, your chapter officers can have permissions. Like I said, DC met, I have a DC chapter site, I have a DC chapter inactive site, and I also have a DC metro area site that I ask for all the members, I don't care who your chapter is, be included in this email so that you know we're there. We capture all the at-larges and all the stragglers um, who have moved into my zip codes to announce our activities. Um, Facebook pages and WhatsApp and media, Twitter, as much as you can get your message out there, I mean, look at all of us. You look at half the people in the room are like this on their cell phones. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> always, always hashtag Sigma Xi in your meeting photos um, and get your word out on your personal page as well as if you have a chapter page. Um, the other thing I like to do is when I have scientists who are doing my cafe series or lecture series, many scientists their language is too complicated for the normal public to understand what we're talking about. So my like little special area is to take what I want you, what you want to talk to us about, and transfer that into what I call baiting the hook. 
and making the title for your cafe interesting and easy to understand so that neighborhood people aren't afraid of it. Um, you start using words that are this long and very technical, it scares people. The public doesn't want to hear that. They want to hear something that means something to them in a language they understand. Um, and so sometimes it's not dummying down what you're talking about, but it's making it more understandable. Um, the other, let's see, uh, da, 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 da. and cooperating with other groups as an area chapter, cooperation is important because my I can't walk to my faculties, <laughs> I can't walk down the hall or half a mile away and talk to my board even. My board is spread across the DC Beltway, so it doesn't happen. Um, but so co cooperating with local groups, uh, the cafe series we ran for 12 years was with the Rockville Science Center. Um, so we did that in cooperation. It didn't chart. The only investment that the DC chapter made is that we, together with the Science Center, invested in a sound system that we could bring to the area bar, restaurant, wherever that we were using. Um, so that investment was, I think, $1,000 that covered 12 years of existence. Um, we didn't pay any of our speakers to come and speak. There was no honorarium. They came to spread their voice about science, and most of them were really readily wanting to do that. Again, tweaking their the topic, your title on your flyers, and your news to say something that means something to the general public. Most of my audiences at my cafes, which were monthly, we averaged between 30 and 125. Um, about 30%, my question at the beginning is, how many are Sigma Xi members? And about 30% of my audience would be, and the rest would be general public. We got involved with the schools. So science teachers would actually send their science students to my cafes, and they had to take selfies with either me or the speaker and tag us and bring that back to school as their proof that they were there. Um, <laughs> so we also got students and their parents to come and sit and listen to the lectures. So we actually had to find a bigger venue because we were, fill we were maxing the space out for safety purposes. Um, and again, we have many at large. We have more at large members than we have chapter members these days. And again, pulling, having, emailing chapter services at Sigma Xi, having them pull a zip code list for you and creating a community from that list, you will capture all those at large people. They may not want to join your chapter, but it keeps them active and it keeps them hopefully asking people that they know to become nominated for Sigma Xi membership. Um, so, yeah, I'm in it for the public understanding of science. That's why I'm a member of Sigma Xi. That's what gets it for me. And in this day and age, we actually need to reach out and make others aware of science. Unfortunately, it's not a commonality anymore. For sure. Virginia. Oh, Virginia. Oh. Okay, so um, this is the section on leadership. A um, couple of the ways that we find people for leadership, although I'm not going to lie to you, it's hard, <laughs> and I'm getting the wrap it up, um, is we do have a subcommittee to give those awards, and that does allow us to identify people who are more interested in helping. Um, as I mentioned before, we've um, decided to let graduate students hold officer positions, and this is a real good resume builder for them, and they also bring such great ideas to the group, and they've got energy, and maybe a little bit more time. Um, let's see, and we are also just, just uh, kind of, we're reworking our officer's packet. This is something I know Doug wants to do as president-elect to really think about um, our succession strategies and making it very clear as to what the duties are and then what, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and really having better notes about where everything is and, and those sorts of things. Um, just seems like when you have people transitioning as often as we do, we do it every year, um, that can get troublesome. Um, Oh, and I just, a canvas site, that's not, yeah, just we have a central area to store all of our files. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Right, leadership. Uh, so, ah, well, we're running late, so we'll just move on to this. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, some, some uh, pro tips here, I think. Uh, probably should have read it in advance. 
Uh, spread the reference around committees of co-chairs. Uh, so one of the things that I think is our one of the real strengths of our chapter is we have a really big executive board. Like uh, a lot of times I, I hear people who have like just basically the uh, – the officers on their executive board. I think that one of the things that really helps us is the fact that we have a big executive board. I, I see no reason not to get as many people on it as possible. That helps with uh, with uh, succession things, but it also helps to spread the effort around. I mean, one of the real challenges of getting people to take something on is the fact that it's too much work, right? So if you can split that amongst multiple people, that really helps quite a bit. Um, uh, board members uh, love titles. One thing I know about faculty members is that they love titles, right? The best thing about titles is they're free. So if you give somebody a title like Director of Communications, boy, that looks good on the CV, but it doesn't cost you anything at all, right? So, and that's particularly true for graduate students. Yeah, it's, I, learned that in I learned that in business. Titles are free. Uh, but the uh, board members love the titles, and uh, particularly graduate students. I mean, that's a useful thing on their CV. I alluded to uh, one of our students earlier who, as director of communications, that helped her pigeonhole directly into a job straight out of graduate school. So, I mean, that's something that we certainly emphasize to other graduate students who are wavering about joining the board. Uh, I would also say that there's uh, one of the things we do is we send acknowledgement letters to people who either serve as chairs uh, or mentors uh, on our different programs as well. I mean, it's, it's a form letter, right? But we send it to their department chair uh, if they're a faculty member or to their mentor if they're a graduate student. And I mean, that helps, you know, it makes them, uh, we, we send it to them and copy it to their chair and it emphasizes the fact that they're supporting aspects of their service mission at the university. So that's something where we've had a lot of really great feedback for. And again, doesn't cost anything and not even that much time. Uh, another thing is uh, writing letters of recommendation for highly active student members. If the students know that you're going to have their back as they look for that next position, they'll really put a lot more effort out for you. So that's one of the things that, uh, and you know, at some uh, smaller institutions, that's an easier thing to get. I mean, you have a much closer relationship with your faculty. But at a place like Ohio State where you have 900 students in your lecture hall, uh, that's something that the students really look for. So it's something you can really get um, students motivated because of. Um, you can award uh, for service and leadership roles for long-term members. Um, you know, uh, when somebody serves on the board and they finish up, we always give them a, a, a frame certificate. You know, that's, I mean, it's nothing more than a color printed parchment, laser color printed parchment on a fairly cheap frame from, a, from but hey, you know, it goes up on their wall. I've seen like, uh, like graduate students who have moved on to faculty positions who have that up on their wall still. So it's something that really makes a difference. And, re and when they see you giving that to somebody, they kind of look forward to it when they leave as well. Again, something that doesn't cost that much, but it makes a difference. It's the little things that count. And uh, you know, it's also important, I think, to instill a, a sense of history about the organization. Um, you know, one of the things that I mentioned earlier, we have that little card we give out uh, at different types of uh, events around campus. But that's got some of the esteemed members of the organization on it. You know, we put down Einstein, we put down all the, all the Nobel Prize winners on the back of the card. And we point out the faculty on campus who are members as well. So um, pointing out some of the, the fact that it's an honor and the fact of the history of the organization actually helps a lot, I think, even with the, with the students today. I think they're really interested in being part of something that has some permanence to it. So that's something I encourage you to do as well. <laughs> I'm just putting the microphone down over there. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta hand this one though. Hot potato. <laughs> we really need to wrap up because I'm sure they want to kick us out of here so the cleaning staff can get done for the night. Um, yeah, I, I shouldn't re be really doing a leadership transition thing because yeah, I've been president for life since 2001, and I am at some points the treasurer, the secretary, and the president and vice president all in one role. Um, but yeah, we're, I'm trying to learn to do this, to get membership, to get leadership succession in my chapter, list the job duties out. People want to know what they're getting into these days, time-wise and everything. What is it going to take? Um, and again, allow your students to have leadership roles in your chapters. Many chapters have been very not uh, friendly to this this idea. They don't want students. They think you need to be a full PhD member to be a member of the board and you don't. There's no rule. Um, and again, getting your message out. Getting your message out to everybody around you. Have the society pull you a zip code list because you don't... I once asked for a zip code list 
And I said, oh yeah, could you possibly printing mail me mailing labels? And, and I got the reply, okay, um, that'd be 3,000 mailing labels. <laughs> and I'm like, how many members do I have around me? And I only have 270 in my chapter. Um, so yeah, do that zip code poll. And I usually base it about 30 miles, 30 miles of zip codes around you because that's about the limit of people gonna commute to come see you, especially in DC area, which driving is abominable. But um, yeah, make sure you're opening your leadership opportunities, job descriptions, time, time sinks, et cetera. Just make them know what they're getting into and the job they're gonna need to do. You'll find people who are passionate as you are if you're open to it. So. I think I don't have a leadership or a communication. Oh, no, that's, that's no oh, personal. I do. Oh. Yeah, I'm done. There. Yeah. Uh, Being a there small chapter, it's easy. Just walk down the corridor or the <laughs> stairs or, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's communication. And leadership is just two person. So, you know, next door, just talk to each other. That's it. <laughs> All right. I guess that's it. We all do things differently depending on your chapter. Areas do it differently from small institutions or big colleges. So what's, it's what works. So. Yeah, that's one of the beauties of the organization in general, I'd say, is you know you can make it, it, it is what you bring to it, right? I mean, the more effort that you and your, uh, your members put into it, the, the more your chapter does. So I mean, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be whatever you want it to be. Next question. Oh, uh, this year for the first time, uh, we had this, uh, when we had an induction ceremony, uh, the students, they were all medical students, and uh, we had them invite the, whatever professor they were working for to come to that induction ceremony. And that made it a really a personal thing to them to see, these, to see their students uh, in that induction ceremony and everything. And, Maybe it'll pay off. I'm hoping. I think they're trying to kick us out. Also, invite family members if they are eligible. Yeah. 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 And I think champagne is important. <laughs> I, do. I think just a small little sip of a toast is, is a really nice cap of the induction ceremony. We would never drink anything at Ohio State. <laughs> We have champagne, you have beer. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Uh, beer and other things. So. That's uh, it. If you have any questions, snag us. I'm going to say I learned a lot from you guys, so I really appreciate sort of hearing all the different perspectives. And I'll just wrap it up for us. We'll wrap it up. Thank, Thank you, you for you guys for attending. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. That was lively. Thank you. So is your last name German? You should go to the German place if it is.